Hey everyone, ready for another deep dive? Today we're tackling a huge GE question, one that has fascinated people for centuries, really. The origins of life itself, <laughs> creation versus evolution. Ooh, yeah, that's a big one. It is. And, uh, you know, it's something that I think we all have some kind of opinion about, whether we've studied it deeply or just kind of absorbed ideas from our culture. Right, right. So today we're going to really try to get to the heart of it, to understand what each side is really saying. We've got some excerpts from a text simply titled, well, Creation Vs Evolution. And right away, it kind of throws us a curveball. Oh. How so? It suggests that maybe both sides are clinging to incomplete truths. Like, what if there's a piece of the puzzle that everyone is missing? Ooh, that's intriguing. I like that. Sets the stage for some open-mindedness right from the start. Exactly. So let's lay the groundwork here. We've got creationism, the idea that life was created by a higher power, often rooted in religious texts and interpretations, mm. especially this idea of intelligent design. Things are just too complex to have happened by chance. Right, like the watch on the beach analogy. Exactly. <laughs> Someone had to have made it. And then we have evolution, the scientific theory that life emerged and changed over an incredibly long period through natural processes like natural selection. We're talking billions of years. Mind-boggling time scales, for mm -hmm. sure. So how does our source text want to approach these two seemingly opposing ideas? Well, it starts by diving into the core arguments of each side. So let's start with creationism. What are some of their main points? Well, creationists often point to the complexity of life. Think about a single cell or the human brain. The vast universe. It's enough to make your head spin. They argue that these intricate systems couldn't have just appeared randomly. They often brought up this thing called the bacterial flagellum. It's this tiny motor that some bacteria use to swim around. Super complex, even at the microscopic level. Yeah, I've heard of that one. It's like, how could that just poof into existence? Exactly. And creationists say that points to an intelligent designer. Like, someone had to create that motor. Okay, so the complexity argument. But wait, evolutionary biologists, they must have some counter argument, yeah, right? They do. They say, yes, things are complex, but that complexity arose gradually over time through this process of evolution. The bacterial flagellum, while it I is complex, they argue it probably developed from simpler structures over eons. And they point out that many parts of this flagellum, they have functions elsewhere in the cell. Ah, so they weren't necessarily designed specifically for movement. Right. So they see it as a product of like incremental changes over a vast amount of time. Okay, so it's not just about complexity itself, but about how W that complexity came to be. Exactly. And you know, it's fascinating to think about, isn't it? Those immense timescales involved. It is. And the source material also points out that creationists bring up a moral dimension to this debate. Oh, right. Yeah. They believe that evolution, you know, with this emphasis on survival of the fittest, it kind of lacks a solid base for morality. Like, yeah. where do things like altruism, love, even consciousness fit into that picture. It's like if we're just products of random chance and this drive to survive, why would we care about anything beyond ourselves? It's a deep question for sure. And our source mentions someone named Ken Ham. Who is he? Oh, Ken Ham. He's a well-known um, young earth creationist, okay. meaning he believes the earth is only like a few thousand years old based on a literal reading of the Bible. He's famous for these big public debates he's had. Most notably, I think, was his debate with Bill Nye, the science guy, back in 2014. I remember that. It was quite a spectacle. It was. It really put this whole debate in the spotlight. Okay, so we've got the creationist perspective. What about the evolution side? What's the science behind their view? So evolutionists, they base their arguments on a ton of evidence. They look at the fossil record, which shows a gradual progression of life forms over millions of years. You've got transitional fossils showing those links between different species. It's like connecting the dots through time. Exactly. And then you've got genetic studies showing how all living things share common ancestry. And there's also microevolution, which is basically evolution happening on a smaller scale that we can actually observe. Wait, hold on. Microevolution. What exactly is that? Think about Darwin's finches those birds he studied in the Galapagos Islands. Each island had finches with like slightly different beak shapes, perfectly adapted to the food on that particular island. Right, I remember learning about those. Over time, those little variations in beak size, driven by natural selection, led to the evolution of distinct finch species. That's microevolution. Small changes building up over time to create bigger differences. Oh, okay, so it's about seeing evolution happening in real time on a smaller scale, not just relying on ancient fossils. Right, exactly. It's about observing those gradual changes as they're happening. Okay, that makes sense. But if evolution is all about survival of the fittest, 
How does that square with altruism like we talked about earlier? The creationist's argument that it just doesn't fit. Well, it's not as contradictory as it might seem at first. You know, fittest in this context doesn't necessarily mean strongest or most aggressive. It means best suited to survive and reproduce in a specific environment. Uh, so it's more about adaptability. Exactly. And sometimes being cooperative, being altruistic, it can actually increase an organism's chances of survival. Like think of pack animals, wolves, for instance. Their ability to cooperate is key to their survival. Right. Makes sense. And in social species, you know, altruism towards family members, it can help ensure the survival of those genes that promote cooperation. It gets pretty complex, actually. Fascinating. So it's not always a ruthless dog-eat-dog -dog world, even in the context of evolution. Right. There's definitely room for cooperation, even selflessness. It all depends on the environment and what traits lead to greater reproductive success in that particular setting. I see, I see. But creationists often accuse evolutionists of using this God of the gaps argument. What do they mean by that? Basically, they're saying that evolutionists use God to fill in the gaps where science doesn't have an explanation yet. Like whenever scientists can't explain something, creationists say, ah, well, that's where God intervened. So it's like, we don't understand it yet, so God must have done it. But science is always discovering new things, right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that kind of undermine that argument? Exactly. You've got it. Science is an ongoing process of discovery. We don't have all the answers right now, but that doesn't mean those answers lie outside of the realm of science. It just means we need to keep exploring, keep asking questions. Makes sense. And speaking of asking questions, our source mentioned someone named D Richard Dawkins. What's his take on all of this? Richard Dawkins? Oh, he's a leading evolutionary biologist. And he's very critical of creationism, very vocal about it. He argues that creationism isn't science. It's a religious belief. And he says it shouldn't be taught in science classes. So he's like firmly in the science camp. <laughs> Definitely. He sees evolution as this powerful explanation for the diversity of life and believes science can ultimately provide answers to those big questions about where we come from. It's like we've got Ken Ham on one side, Richard Dawkins on the other, really embodying those two opposing views. Exactly. It's a classic clash of ideologies. But there's a twist. Our source brings up this third way, which is called theistic evolution. Ooh, a third way. I'm intrigued. What's that all about? Well, instead of seeing creation and evolution as completely opposite, theistic evolution proposes that evolution could actually be the method, the tool that a creator used to bring life into being. So it's like saying God set everything in motion and then let the laws of nature, including evolution, do their thing. Precisely. And there are some big names in science who hold this view. Like Francis Collins, for example. Francis Collins, who's that? He's a world-renowned geneticist, led the Human Genome Project, mapped out the entire human genetic cum. Wow, so a real scientific heavyweight. For sure. And he's a devout Christian who fully accepts the evidence for evolution. He sees no conflict between his faith and his scientific understanding. That's pretty amazing. So a living example of someone who bridges that gap between science and religion. Yes. But our source mentions this middle ground is often rejected by folks on both sides. Some creationists see it as a compromise of their religious beliefs, and some evolutionists see it as bringing in unnecessary supernatural elements into a scientific explanation. Oh, wow. So it's like you can't win. But, you know, this whole debate goes way beyond science and religion, right? right? It has a huge implications for our culture, for politics. It's something people argue about in schools, in courtrooms, even on the international stage. You're absolutely right. It's not just a theoretical discussion. It touches so many aspects of our lives. It shapes how we view the world, how we educate our children, and even how we govern ourselves. It's a lot to unpack, that's for sure. It really is. And you know what? We're actually going to dig into some of those specific implications after a quick break. Sounds good. We'll be right back after this. Okay, so we're back and ready to dive even deeper into this whole creation versus evolution thing. And it's amazing how this debate, it's not just happening in like science labs or churches, it's everywhere. It even influences how we think about ethical issues. You're right, it pops up in some surprising places like bioethics, for example, how we view the beginning of human life. Whether it's a divine creation or a product of evolution, it can really impact our stance on things like abortion or stem cell research. Wow, yeah. That's huge. It's like those questions are informed by our beliefs about where we come from. Exactly. And what about how we treat the environment? If we see ourselves as stewards of a divine creation, will we make different choices than if we see ourselves as just one species among millions, all competing for resources in this ever-changing world? Hmm. That's a good point. So many layers to this. 
And speaking of different perspectives, our source brings up this education dilemma. What role should this debate play in how we teach kids about our origins? Oh, yeah, that's a big one. It's one thing for adults to debate this stuff, but what about young minds? Should we be teaching both creationism and de-evolution in schools? And if so, how do we do it fairly? How do we make sure we're not undermining scientific literacy in the process? It's tricky, for sure. There are strong arguments on both sides. Some people say that teaching both creationism and evolution side by side encourages critical thinking. Students can weigh the evidence, consider different perspectives, and reach their own conclusions. It's about empowering them to think for themselves. Right. It's like saying, hey, here are different ways people have tried to understand this big question. Now go explore, ask questions, and see what makes sense to you. I can see the value in that approach. Yeah, it's about fostering curiosity and open-mindedness. But I can also see the other side of the argument. Wouldn't teaching creationism alongside evolution in science class kind of create this false equivalency? Like saying, okay, here's the scientific method, a rigorous way of understanding the natural world, and here's a story from a religious text. They both explain the origins of life equally well. Something doesn't feel quite right about that, does it? Yeah, you've hit on a key concern. Critics of that approach worry it might give students the impression that science is just another belief system, like any other instead of, you know, a method based on evidence, on testable explanations. It could be confusing, for sure. For sure. It's like comparing apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. And as we mentioned before, the media doesn't always help. Mm -hmm. It often throws fuel on the fire by portraying the debate in black and white terms, all about conflict and controversy, which makes it hard for people to form their own, you know, new nuanced opinions. Oh, yeah. The media's influence is huge. They often frame things in a way that reinforces stereotypes, like creationists are anti-science, evolutionists are militant atheists, and that's just like the reality for so many people. There's a whole spectrum of views within both camps. And those documentaries, you know, those ones where they have scientists and religious figures debating, it's like a boxing match. Makes for good TV, but doesn't really help us understand the real issues at play. Exactly. It's all about the drama, the entertainment, not about digging deeper. And social media. Mm -hmm. Don't even get me started. It just amplifies those extreme viewpoints, creates these echo chambers where people only hear what they already believe. It makes it really tough to have a productive conversation, you know? It's a shame because I feel like there's so much common ground that gets lost in all the noise and all the fighting. You're so right. And, you know, our source makes this really important point that I think is worth repeating. Maybe the most important thing isn't about choosing a side. It's about being open-minded. So it's not about being right or wrong. It's about being willing to consider different perspectives, even those that challenge our own beliefs. Exactly. Because are we really willing to admit that we might not have all the answers? That there might be more to the story than we currently understand? That's where real growth and understanding can happen. It's kind of humbling, isn't it? To admit that we might not have it all figured out. Mm. But it can also be freeing, right? It opens us up to new possibilities, new ways of seeing the world. That's a great way to put it. And it leads us to another important point our source brings up, how the media shapes how the public sees this whole debate. It sometimes feels like they're more interested in stirring up drama than helping people understand the nuances. It's true. It's like they're setting up this boxing match between science and religion instead of presenting it as a complex conversation about different ways of trying to understand the world. What do you think about that? It does seem like the media likes to oversimplify things, right? They focus on the conflict, the controversy, instead of really trying to dig into the deeper questions. It's a shame because even with all that noise, all that division, our source suggests there might be more common ground than we think. Oh, interesting. Where do they see that common ground? Well, they point to our shared sense of wonder. Think about it. Whether you're more drawn to creationism or evolution, we can all appreciate the incredible vastness of the universe, the complexity of life, the mystery of consciousness. These things kind of blow our minds, no matter what we believe about how they came to be. I like that. It's like we're all standing on the shore of this huge ocean, looking out at the horizon, trying to make sense of it all. We might have different ideas about what's out there, but that sense of awe, of wanting to understand, that's something we all share. I love that analogy. And, you know, our source reminds us that maybe the most important thing isn't about finding the right answer. It's about embracing the journey of exploration, of asking questions, of being willing to change our minds when new information comes along. So it's less about the destination and more about, like, enjoying the ride. Exactly. And that journey can be so enriching, even if it doesn't lead us to a simple, clear-cut answer. 
I could see that. But I keep coming back to these bigger questions like, what does all this mean for how we see ourselves, you know, our role in the world? If we believe we were created by a higher power for a purpose, that could give us the sense of responsibility, like we have a duty to fulfill. Mm -hmm. But if we see ourselves as a product of evolution, does that change how we view our place in everything? It makes you wonder, doesn't it? Does evolution lead to a more materialistic outlook where it's all about survival and self-interest? Or could it lead us to a sense of interconnectedness, realizing we're all part of this web of life and we need to take care of each other and the planet? It's like, are we separate from nature, here to dominate and control it? Or are we a part of nature, connected to everything responsible for keeping the balance? Those are the big questions for sure. And it shows how this debate about where we come from, it actually has real world consequences. The way we answer those questions can shape our values, our actions, and even the future of our planet. Wow. So as we wrap up this deep dive, where do we land? What's the big takeaway here? You know, I don't think there's one single answer. And maybe that's okay. Maybe the real value is in the questions themselves, in that journey of exploration, in the ongoing conversation between science and faith, between what we know and what we still don't understand. So it's about embracing the mystery, being okay with not having all the answers, and maybe even finding some beauty in the unknown. Beautifully put. And, you know, by being open to that mystery, by being willing to listen to different viewpoints, maybe we can find a way to bridge those gaps between us and move forward together as, you know, caretakers of this amazing planet. I love that. Well said. So to everyone listening, we encourage you to keep exploring these ideas. Don't stop asking questions. Keep searching for understanding. Keep diving deep. And remember, even if we don't all agree on the answers, the journey itself is worth it. You never know what you might discover along the way. Keep those minds curious, folks.